Yes. Uh, I will invite you and you can introduce. Nanshio, could you able to hear me? Yeah, sorry. I just went to pick up my phone. Very good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Perfect, yeah. perfect. So over to uh, Dr. Jitain. You can uh, start the proceeding today. Thank you, Dr. Felix. So welcome you all uh, over this uh, Zoom platform to the third day or last day of the Blue Planet lecture series. Today we will have two lectures. One is in the mornings. In the morning session, it is in from 11 to 12 o'clock, and the next one is at 3:30 to 4:30, followed by the concluding session. And today, uh, in the first session, we have uh, we have our speaker today with uh, us, Dr. Nancy Murges. And uh, in the panel, we have uh, our uh, colleagues, Dr. Uh, Krishna Kant, is associate professor. In the Department of Geology, Dr. Felix Bas, Associate Professor in the Department of Botany, Dr. Uh, Milan Sarma from uh, Department of Geology, Assistant Professor, Department of Geology. So, and uh, uh, who else is there? Yes, uh, Dr. Prabhu Prasad, who was the earlier speaker, he is also in the uh, in the panel. So now I will invite Dr. Krishna Khan to introduce our today's speaker to the participants. To the audience, Dr. Krishna Kandu, okay. over to you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Jitendra, uh, for introducing me here. Uh, good morning to all present here. Uh, welcome to the uh, Blue Planet series. Today uh, we have uh, Dr. Nonshio Murukes among us as the first speaker of uh, today's session. Uh, let me quickly introduce him on this platform today. Dr. Nunshio Murukes, uh, who is currently working as Scientist D at uh, National Center for Polar and Ocean Research, Goa. And probably we could say that he is one of the few persons who visited both poles, South Poles also, and then North Pole also. And we are very, very uh, privileged to have here today because he's going to uh, share his thought experience and then the, all the uh, you know, learnings that he has met uh, so far from these areas, which are very, very uh, you know, uh, specific areas where many of us cannot go there. So uh, he has a lot of uh, awards uh, on his credit. Some of them, which I can just mention quickly here, is that he was a research fellow in 2009 uh, awarded by a uh, scientific committee on Antarctic research. Then he was also uh, has uh, awarded uh, this outstanding contribution in solar uh, in polar science merit award given by Ministry of Earth Sciences in 2018. As I mentioned previously, that he has participated in expeditions to Antarctica. Arctic, which are you know located close to both poles, and then other southern ocean, which are again, uh, the, uh, I mean the uh, oceans which are not able to you know uh, visited by many many of us, and uh, his research area includes climatology, oceanography, climate change, numerical modeling, and so on. Now he has. Uh, many uh, publications, more than 25 publications published in high impact factor international journals. So uh, 
and also he has professional records like uh, scientist B, C, and currently he is on a scientist stage. So we all are very, very fortunate to have you here today, sir. And uh, we are expecting that uh, your experiences and your uh, thoughts will enlighten us, all of us are, uh, you know, uh, who are present in this platform. So I uh, welcome you once again, and then I request you to proceed with your presentation, sir. Yes, over to you, Jitendji. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Krishnakant, for your nice introduction. And now I will invite Dr. Nancio uh, to start your presentation. Uh, Dr. Krishnakant, kindly stop your screen. All right. All right. Stop okay. sharing your yes. screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, now I have to share my screen, right? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to deliver this uh, talk. And uh, it's indeed a pleasure, particularly during these uh, lockdown times that uh, it's, it's nice to interact with uh, uh, a lot of uh, people from different aspects of different uh, topics and different, uh, uh, with this different experiences. Sorry to, I, sorry to interrupt you. Can you switch in your video? Is video is not uh, on. Yeah, I know. Uh, now I have to wait one second. I'm not quite experienced with that. In the left side bottom, you have a video uh, option. Switch. So that all the participants can see you. This is the one? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Now we can see you. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Fine, fine. It's perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah. Please go ahead. Please yeah. go ahead. And, uh, now share screen is where? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the bottom panel, there is a share screen, green color button, uh, arrow oh, okay, mark okay, of okay. arrow. So, okay. and uh, once you click that, then you can select the window, which one you want to uh, project. So that, that particular window will open. Yes, it's, uh, it's coming. Only thing is uh, you have to make a full screen. That's all. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, perfectly fine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So once again, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation and thanks for a, a nice uh, uh, introduction. And uh, today what I'm going to do is that I'm going to hope you, I'm, I'm, I'm audible to you all. I just, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes, you can. Uh, I can hear yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, so this is uh, so this is the World Ocean Day. So uh, so it is. Uh, it, you may be quite uh, surprising to uh, find that there is a topic like Arctic. One of the major reasons for this is like uh, it's because uh, Arctic is uh, uh, a good part of the uh, Arctic region is uh, is, a, is is ocean. It is the Arctic Ocean, which connects the Pacific and the Atlantic. And there is a lot of significance to that. And uh, why we, the, what I'm going to do is like, I will give you an introduction to the Arctic and then I will uh, explain some of the significance of it. And, uh, um, uh, and yeah, that's what I'm going to do. But when I explain the significance of the Arctic, it's mostly, uh, it's mostly about the significance to us. So Arctic is a, is a region, there is a lot of culture to that. There is a lot of community living in that, in the, living in that place. So they, they, they got a lot of uh, significance for them. For example, the, uh, the, the Inuit population or the Sami reindeer herders. Uh, when, 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 when we talk about Arctic, it's, they are all the integral part of, uh, integral part of the uh, part of the Arctic. But in this particular talk, uh, it will be mostly, uh, uh, the, the, the stress is mostly on uh, uh, the, the, the significance of uh, Arctic, particularly for us, those who live in the, in the tropic. 
the topics. So I will uh, start with a small introduction to the Arctic. And uh, uh, the word Arctic actually comes from uh, uh, the Greek word Arctos, which means beer. And why, uh, which means a bear. Why that, why, why that, why, why it came is because those, uh, the sailors the, uh, who ventured into the Arctic Ocean uh, uh, long ago has spotted this constellation in the sky and uh, they somehow related it with uh, uh, the kind of a creature that normally they see. Even now also we see this kind of uh, creature in the Arctic and that is a polar bear. And uh, those people who know the polar bear probably can associate immediately with this uh, uh, with this, uh, this this sketch with the uh, with the shape of a polar bear. So, uh, and that is also major. And if you slightly turn it around, it's it's more clear actually. That that's how somehow the polar bear look like. So the word Arctic comes from uh, this uh, constellation, and it is uh, because of the sailors who ventured out into the Arctic uh, long ago. So, uh, but for our definition of Arctic, it's not uh, that actually. It is, uh, it is a region that encompasses something around 63 degrees of north. That, that's the red circle. The north of 63 degree north till, till the North Pole. And that's what uh, mostly the geographical uh, uh, location of the geographical, uh, uh, the, geographic, the, the, the region that encompasses the Arctic is those that above 63 degrees and it's north. That, that's not alone is the definition of Arctic. There is another definition. There are many more definitions as well. But this particular definition is related with the 10 degree isotherm. Isotherm is actually the line of uh, uh, a constant temperature. In this particular case, it is a 10 degree isotherm during the peak summer. And that extends from, uh, it's almost, it is the 63 degree latitude, but it extends down, down in, the, in the North Atlantic below the, below the Greenland and uh, somewhat into the Chukchi Sea and the Bering Strait. And this is also the a definition of Arctic. There is another definition that uh, uh, that is actually the, the the North Arctic is the region that is north of the uh, tree line. Tree line means that uh, the last place where we can uh, see the trees, and somewhere it is uh, the tree line is somewhere around here. And in, in, in the Norway, it is somewhere around here, and in uh, in uh, Greenland or in the in the Canadian archipelago, it may be somewhere else. So, but roughly, it uh, it it most most of the definitions are. Uh, the, the region uh, encompasses by most of the definitions are more or less similar. So that's that's actually the, uh, the Arctic from a geographical point of view, from a political uh, from a political map of uh, political map or the geographical map, it will basically look something like this. And there is a lot of nomenclature associated with that. There is a Barents Sea, the Kara Sea, Lapte Sea, and there are a hell lot of names are associated with the Baffin Bay. And some of these are etched in the folklore of uh, the respective country. For example, ba Baffin Bay, the Canadian and uh, 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 the Canadian Arctic in Baffin Bay. And there was famous songs also related to those, all those uh, kind of uh, places. It's because there is culture, there is, uh, there is a culture that has been thriving uh, since a long time. It is unlike the, the this is unlike the south, the, the southern, uh, the south pole of Antarctica where it's very difficult to find this kind of uh, very names. And also the importance of Arctic, another thing is that it connects the Atlantic and the Pacific. So we will uh, we will go to the, the the climate part of the Arctic, the Arctic climate, and it's like see every the the uh, our weather and the climate change because of the uh, the motion of the Earth around the sun, and uh, uh, the summer, winter, and autumn is and it's uh, um, it 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 leads to the kind of uh, uh, warming and cooling in the Earth atmosphere, and it will be uh, during summer and winter. Winter will be the, the most coldest time in, on it, and as well as the summer is the most warmest. We, we all know, but how in the Arctic it looks like? In the Arctic, it looks like something like this. And this is the summertime, uh, summertime Arctic, and this is the wintertime Arctic. And you see, the temperature is dramatically lower. It it's comes around something around uh, like uh, minus, uh, minus 20, minus 30, something like that. It is quite unimaginable for people who live in the tropics. For example, uh, for instance, those people who live in the the northern part of India may experience some of it, but this kind of uh, a dramatic uh, uh, change in temperature to almost about 30 degrees Celsius is quite difficult to uh, difficult to see in, in, in most of the other places. Of the, for example, this is uh, this is uh, the temperature along the west coast of India. See how 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 modest it is when you compare with the ch temperature changes in the Arctic. It's something around five degrees Celsius change and in, in a year. And uh, whereas in Arctic, it is about uh, almost uh, 30 degrees Celsius. And you see the peak of the temperature, the most of the peak temperature comes somewhere around in June, July. And here we have 
somewhere in the main. That is because of uh, uh, the uh, because of all uh, monsoons. So uh, ju this is just to uh, ju just to just to compare our uh, uh, um, the climate with the, that of uh, that of the Arctic. So, uh, so th thus we know that there is a, a seasonal variability with the temperature. How uh, it is, uh, it is important to note since we are dealing with the climate, and it's important to know how, in the long term, it, it looks like. And that is the temperature that is from the Nivellisund, where we uh, have our observation. This observation is uh, collected by the Norwegian Meteorological Department since a very really long time, so from the 1975. And you can clearly see that there is an annual cycle associated with that, just the summer and uh, winter uh, cycle. It is the summer and this is the winter. The, the lowest portion is actually the winter temperature. And occasionally it is not 30 degrees Celsius, sometimes it goes to even minus 40 degrees Celsius. But what you see is actually, what is the most uh, striking feature of this uh, diagram is that if you see the summer temperature, it's, it's, it's not that actually much changing. But if you see the winter temperature and it's, it's progressively increasing. And this is, uh, this is a very important question that is, uh, uh, people are trying to answer uh, when you deal with Arctic climate variability, that increase in the winter temperature. There are a lot of uh, uh, theories are there um, that deals with uh, why this is happening uh, in the Arctic. And this is, uh, this is just from the station in New Ellison, and in most of the places it is quite uh, similar, similar features we can, we can expect. And even in the past also, if you say the, the, in the past, the temperature is uh, uh, the, the, the temperature is almost uh, uh, below freezing all the time. But if you see in the last 10,000 years also, just we can see anywhere else in the globe also, it's like that it is almost uh, the, the annual average temperature. This may be like, it's maybe a thousands of years or hundreds of years average. So we can see that it's quite close to this, close to the zero, the average temperatures. And this is what we call, uh, uh, this, is, this part is actually we are most interested in, and this is where we live now also. So, what will happen when uh, uh, when such kind of uh, uh, dramatic temperature change happens in the in the, in the Arctic? So, uh, it is uh, so the atmosphere uh, when the, when the Earth turns away from the sun, uh, it receives less sunlight and uh, uh, it loses much of the heat. And what happens when that happens is actually something called the grand freeze, which I call, it. and that is the grand freeze is uh, uh, something like this, almost. Uh, uh, 75, 65, 70 percent of the Arctic Ocean will be covered by uh, ice. This is something phenomenal, actually. When we, we for example, for those who live in the live in the tropics, uh, an ocean or uh, almost uh, three quarters of uh, uh, of the ocean is covered by ice, and that essentially cut off the ocean from the atmosphere and reducing the air interaction. This is quite an important aspect in, uh, in, in, in the evolution of the weather and climate uh, in, those, in those regions. And uh, uh, when, we, when we talk about the uh, ice formation in the Arctic, it is not that straightforward, actually. It is not like just you um, keep some water in the fridge and it, uh, uh, it, it freezes over. It is it's something more complicated, actually, something more uh, uh, so, uh, something more like it's it's because of the fact that uh, because of uh, the fact that if you see that the density of the fresh water which is maximum at four degrees Celsius somewhere around four degrees Celsius and below that it freezes down and uh, below that uh, uh, at, at zero degrees Celsius the temperature freezes down but uh, the seawater is uh, is not fresh actually it, it has its components like it is we call we call it as salinity and uh, the maximum density also varies with uh, uh, the salinity, the maximum, the salinity. So uh, as the salinity increases, the density of the temperature also increases, which reduces the freezing point. And uh, for a 35 PSU of salinity, the, 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 the freezing point will be some, somewhere around minus 2, 1 point, minus 1.8 degrees Celsius. So uh, for me, it was quite, uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, you can call it a surprise, or it was quite uh, like something like that when I first measured uh, temperature of uh, below zero degrees Celsius in water. It's, it was quite like I was kind of like, yeah, uh, that was my very, 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 very nice experience for me. So this was something like when you, for a, a, tro a tropical dollar ventures into the uh, polar region, uh, this, uh, many of these kind of interesting things will happen into your life. So this is quite important, actually, because um, when the ice freezes down, 
uh, uh, the temperature has, if the ice has to freeze, the, the, the seawater has to freeze, then the temperature has to go below zero degrees Celsius and it almost, uh, it, it has to touch almost minus two degrees Celsius. So when such thing happen, when such cooling happens, and we know that the, the, the temperature in the Arctic is, uh, can come quite, to, quite close to minus 40 degrees Celsius, minus 30 degrees Celsius, on an average, maybe around minus 15 to minus 20 degrees Celsius in the winter. So it's, uh, so the sea, our sea will be frozen. And most of the, uh, and we have seen that it's almost like 75% of the sea. And this is what it's, it looks like. And that is the Arctic. This is the Greenland. And uh, this is the Canadian Arctic. And this is the Russian Arctic. This is the Bering Sea and Chakti Sea. And that blue portion represents, uh, uh, represents the, uh, the ice. And one means that uh, this, this, this is the ice concentration in each grid of uh, uh, each grid. And this is almost about uh, one, uh, this is uh, the ice concentration in one degree grid. So one, one, uh, the, ice, uh, the ice concentration, one means that, that that grid is fully covered with ice. So, for example, and here the, along the margins, we can say that it is 0.4, means that 0.4 of a one degree grid, one by one degree grid is covered by sea ice. So let's play this movie. Uh, this is a movie and it's, it's take you to the, all the uh, 12 month cycle of uh, sea ice in Arctic. So this is what it looks like. So uh, uh, during winter, it, uh, it comes, uh, it expands and during uh, the summer, it's, it shrinks to almost uh, uh, very low concentrations in uh, sea ice. And you see that most of the Central Arctic is still uh, has a lot of uh, ice even during summer. And this sea ice is actually, uh, the, this, the changes in the sea ice is actually an important uh, um, uh, focus of uh, research in, uh, uh, in today's uh, climate science. So, so apart from that, what will happen to the ocean and the, uh, in, in the Arctic? Uh, when, when the temperature cools down. Let's, let's look at a small uh, kitchen experiment. This kitchen experiment is like this. This is, uh, I made some ice cubes with some color onto that. And then I tried to place it on the top of the water. This is a simple experiment that we can uh, uh, do at home and we have done it also. And what, what significance it has got with the climate science, we'll, uh, we will see in the next slide. And you see that the, the green color drops down. This is simply because that green color is more dense and uh, that, that is a cold water that is uh, going down. So um, as the ice forms uh, here, it is like uh, I am cooling the top of the ocean or reducing the cold water on the top of the uh, top of that top of the jar, and we can see that uh, it, it, it is going down, and uh, the water, the dense water, sinks. That's what it's all about. And such kind of a large uh, kitchen experiment do uh, happen in the Arctic, and that is what we call the global thermohaline circulation. And because of the, the cooling of uh, uh, in, in, in the northern uh, high latitudes or the regions that are close to the Arctic, the, the seawater sinks and it uh, traces back to the uh, tropics, all the way uh, to the tropics and all the way to the Antarctica, and then it comes somewhere, it, it, it upwells somewhere near, near the Indonesian archipelago, form as a surface current and then flows back, uh, crossing the uh, equator and then crossing the South Africa and then again joins the North Atlantic. And this process is of uh, hundreds of years of time scale. It's something that uh, regulates the uh, global climate. And this is what is called the global conveyor belt. So, um, so these are this uh, this this white color is actually the the surface currents, and this uh, blue is uh, the uh, uh, deep deep current. So you can see that uh, some part of it uh, goes north and joins the Gulf Stream, and then go, goes to the north. And then we can see that some part of it uh, circulates along the Antarctica, uh, upwards uh, somewhere in the Western Pacific, moves across the. Indonesian, uh, uh, Indonesian through flow region, and then joins the uh, uh, join, then then flow as a surface current, and cross the uh, South African continent, and then moves into the uh, northern uh, Atlantic again. This process takes a lot of uh, years, hundreds of years, time scale, and uh, is actually the 
uh, regulator of the global climate on those uh, time scales. And this is actually, uh, this is we call the global conveyor belt. So this along with the sea ice uh, problem in the Antarctic forms an important uh, aspect of uh, uh, um, global uh, climate. So uh, another look at uh, the, the, the sea ice, just like we had a, uh, we had a, uh, look at the temperature in the sea ice, uh, temperature in the New Elysium, or temperature in the atmosphere temperature. The sea ice in the Arctic also uh, has a seasonal cycle, but at the same time, we can see that um, the, 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 the concentration of the sea ice uh, declines, the, the minimum concentration declines. So this is not really coincident with the winter time temperature. This is actually the, the, the minimum occurs sometime in the September uh, or, or late August or September. That is the September sea ice minimum. And the September sea ice minimum is uh, declining. Uh, means that the September is almost getting ice free. That's what so far we have seen. Uh, this is the average of uh, the ice uh, obtained from the Hadley Center sea ice data. So, uh, so, so, far, uh, so far that we have seen that there is availability uh, and uh, the atmospheric temperature is uh, uh, increasing, particularly in the winter, and the sea ice uh, is uh, decreasing. It's, uh, it's a focus of a lot of research, but what, what, will, uh, what, what happened into the future, actually? The, so far, what is observed and uh, uh, observed temperature uh, changes in the Arctic is, uh, it's more than twice the global average in the, uh, 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 the Arctic is, is warming quite fast at a faster rate uh, than the globe. And even the projections are also not any different. So uh, Arctic is going to be one of the warmest region uh, uh, on the earth, uh, maybe by, uh, uh, so that is not the warmest region. The, the rate of warming will be uh, the maximum in that uh, Arctic. And accordingly, we can expect the consequences. For example, the decline in sea ice or uh, the increased uh, exposure of ocean to the atmosphere, increase in uh, the atmosphere ocean interactions in, this, in the Arctic. So these are all quite become important as the temperature increases in Arctic. So uh, let's, let's look at some of those uh, consequences uh, uh, in, in Arctic. So uh, does this uh, changes uh, really affect uh, the Arctic and the, uh, and the rest of the world? Uh, yes, indeed, and it is uh, true uh, this uh, north-southeast exchanges, there will be increased river discharges. And of course, as I said, there will be more atmosphere, uh, uh, ocean interaction and uh, ocean circulation. And of course, the global carbon cycle. Uh, so uh, what, what is more important for me as a, a person who is dealing with uh, atmosphere ocean interaction processes, it is actually the influence on atmospheric circulation and of course, uh, we have a we have we have a concern over the uh, sea level rise because uh, we have a long coastline almost 7,500 uh, kilometers of uh, coastline, some of which are very vulnerable to the changes in the sea level. So these are all the aspects that we need to care uh, when we study the processes or when we study the impact of uh, polar regions. So that's it actually in Arctic. That is the contribution of. Uh, uh, the Arctic uh, land ice and uh, glaciers into, in the, into the uh, global sea level, uh, global uh, global sea level. This is, is the this is in millimeter, and that uh, that the light purple is actually for 2030, and uh, it is actually in the 2080. This is all the projections. So in the later part of this century, the contributions from the Arctic uh, ice will be uh, more uh, for, more to the sea level. Perhaps this this we can uh, uh, see some in in, in our lifetime. This, uh, these contributions, or the enhanced contributions of uh, Arctic, uh, Arctic land ice. So uh, we, we also uh, have uh, uh, discussed that in the previous slides that uh, it changes the atmospheric uh, circulation, uh, the Arctic uh, Ocean and Arctic, uh, uh, changes in the Arctic regions influence Arctic, uh, Arctic and, and atmospheric circulation. This is once as example in which um, uh, the changes in the sea ice, particularly in the Barents and Karas, you can see the Barents and Karas is somewhere here. Uh, you can see the Barents and Karas is somewhere here. And 
a small portion of this sea is actually subjected to, uh, this this part of this uh, well, arctic ocean is subjected to very intense uh, changes and the reduction in sea ice as uh, this has uh, 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 led to the uh, cold outbreaks into the uh, eastern asia particularly in the eastern asia because of the changes in the polar waters and uh, this is a model study is uh, done by kim et al which shows that indeed the reduction in the uh, sea ice falls is something called uh, Rossby wave up in the atmosphere and it uh, uh, destabilizes the polar vortex and that, that is the polar cap height if the polar cap height is negative which means that there it has uh, the polar vortex has slackened and what happens when what are the implications for that actually when uh, when it happens when it happens the polar uh, this is a stable polar vortex so uh, if there are uh, if the sea ice is less and there is much more ice interaction and it sends Rossby wave up into the atmosphere then and uh, it becomes more wavy and that more waviness will uh, send more cold air down in to the down into the to the lower latitudes and if you remember in 2019 and this has happened actually in north india it was uh, as cold as uh, this was a news report and uh, i still remember when i visited uh, my home uh, down in kerala during uh, december january in those days It was so cold. My mother, uh, my cousin brother was telling that uh, this uh, that the day was showed 80 degrees Celsius. So that was uh, that could be an impact of uh, the polar vortex, uh, the changes in polar vortex, and which in turn could have been forced by a change in uh, the uh, the changes in the uh, sea ice in the Arctic. So the the, the changes in the Arctic are uh, uh, so far-reaching. It it can uh, in, in, it can in fact influence an entire hemisphere. Not only this, uh, if you remember the uh, Uttarakhand flash flood, which uh, led to the another uh, famous book of the Rage of the River, um, it shows that there is an intrusion of uh, uh, Arctic air masses uh, during the days of uh, intense rainfall. For example, 14 to 17 June was the intense rainfall. Somehow, the models was unable to predict that. And this is a study from IATM by Suspendar Joseph et al., which shows that. And then there was a cyclone which formed somewhere in the northern Bay of Bengal, moved north and interacted with this. Uh, uh uh with this uh, cold anomaly and resulting in uh, uh flash floods uh so these are the kind of uh, things that we still uh, we have to uh, we, we need more research to uh, to understand uh so so is it is it all about actually like uh, is this uh, is this all that uh, that the arctic influences uh, uh, the lower latitudes or is the other way around is also there like uh, if you Uh, say so whether the tropics influences the arctic there are studies that points in that direction as well for example the marin julian oscillation is a is an intraseasonal oscillation that happens in the tropics is known to create a, the blocking over the northern europe and uh, if there is a blocking the circulation can really impact uh, the arctic uh, arctic ocean and uh, its uh, properties so we also have a uh, uh, find some kind of uh, propagation you don't need to worry about this uh, uh, diagrams as such it is it just shows uh, how the ocean atmosphere interacts and that interaction is uh, is carried into the uh, different location in this case into the uh, high latitudes by way of uh, something called rossby wave and this is these vectors indicate the rossby wave activity flux it tells nothing but it tells uh, it, it it just tells that where the rossby wave is originated and where it is going it as simple as that and during the last week of uh, december 2015 uh, the marine Mar oscillation was uh, strongly in, uh, active and it sends uh, uh, rossby wave uh, into the uh, arctic region and we have recorded very strong uh, intense rainfall and uh, during the last week of uh, december in our observatories in the arctic so there is a two way connection actually and not only that actually there are uh, studies that links the uh, the monsoon and the northern high latitudes so for example th this is the same uh, concept of the same rossby waves that travel during the intense monsoon this this diagram represents the rossby wave activity between strong and weak intense summer monsoon so uh, there we can see that it propagates all the way uh, along the uh, the sub subtropical jet this is actually the the black black contours indicate the subtropical jet and it goes all the way and from the north atlantic it it moves slightly northeastward into the arctic and then forms as again the arrow here is similar to the one that i have shown in the last uh, uh, slide which is the rossby wave activity flux and uh, the down one is actually the geopotential height at uh, high differences at each level 
along this uh, red line. So what it essentially shows is that um, uh, there are studies that suggest that the links between the tropical features and the, uh, and, and the polar high latitudes. So what we can uh, conclude, what we can, uh, what we can understand from this is that uh, uh, the, the link is not one way. That it is not the tropics that influence the Arctic or the Arctic that influences the uh, tropic. It is not so. It is, there is a consistent interaction between uh, uh, the high latitudes as well as uh, the low latitudes. And uh, there requires a, a thorough understanding of the processes of both local and remote. And uh, the mechanisms that connect is critical in understanding the, the, uh, the global climate variability. This is actually the significance in, uh, uh, in our climate. This is actually important in, our, in, in terms of the climate research. So otherwise, our, uh, uh, the, our representation of the climate will be something like this. Like, uh, it, is, it will be like something, a uh, few blind men see an elephant. Like somebody will say that it is a sphere, and somebody will say it's a fan or it's a wall. But it's actually, indeed, it's everything. So we need to understand all those. That's why we, we need to understand every aspect of it. That's why we need to go to different places and conduct research, like in Arctic or in Antarctic or in any other place. That's what the significance of the polar research, particularly for us. So uh, we go there. And uh, then the next one or two slides, I will try to uh, show you the kind of efforts that we are uh, uh, taking in, uh, uh, in the Arctic. And this is our home in Arctic, actually. It is called the Himadani, where we do, where we stay and we, we, we conduct experiments mostly into the fjord or in, uh, in, in, in the glaciers, or uh, we have uh, an uh, atmospheric observatory collaboratory slightly away from uh, our uh, uh, this, uh, Himadani. And this is how we go there. And this is with this uh, uh, small movie, I will uh, thank you for your time. and. Uh, I can answer uh, your uh, queries uh, at all if you if you have at all. So this is how this is how we go there. In fact.
Yeah, uh, that is uh, that comes to a full circle actually. And uh, if you have any questions, then I can uh, I'll try to answer that. Uh, thank you, Nancyo, for your wonderful talk. And uh, it was uh, started with the definition that name Arctic. It was really wonderful. Many of us we use that we use that term that Arctic in the north and Antarctic in south. But why and how it that term came, the name came. It was really wonderful to explain that one and your uh, work also. It very nicely you have uh, covered all the aspect of the climate, how the Arctic environment is important for the globe. It was a really wonderful talk and uh, there are many questions. So now I will uh, invite uh, Dr. Punita. Uh, Dr. Punita, she is here. Uh, so I will invite her to pick the question from the poll. Actually, there are many questions, so I'll invite the panelists. So I'll invite Dr. Punita to pick the question from the question bank and then, yeah. Pick the uh, Dr. Nansho, just a point. Uh, could you please exit the PowerPoint um, in the presentation window? There is an option there to exit uh, yeah. the presentation window so we can see your face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hello, sir. Yeah. Good morning, sir. It has been a very wonderful lecture and a very interesting one also, especially the last video that you showed. <clears throat> that gave us an overall glimpse of your research work in Arctic, and it's really very, you know, impressive. So uh, what I'm going to do is a few of the questions have, uh, participants have asked. So I'll just uh, browse through them and then ask you from th that. The first question that uh, one of our participants, Gaurav Wari, has asked, why the minimum temperature in tropopause is found above tropics and not above poles? So this is... Sorry, I could not uh, get the question. Okay. Uh, should I repeat my question, sir? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, if I heard it correctly, it is. Uh, it is like that. Is why the minimum uh, temperature is uh, uh, in the tropopause. Is at uh, yes, sir. Uh, is at pole. Sorry, is that, above uh, the tropics and not above the pole. Not, not above the pole. Uh, yes, sir. I do not know actually. Like <laughs> mostly, my uh, research is uh, mostly on the uh, troposphere or maximum in the lower troposphere. So I actually do not have not uh, encountered such a thing in the in my in my studies. So I really don't know. Uh, maybe I have. I will have a look at it and get back to you. Like, yeah. Sure, sir. Sure, yeah, no yeah, issues. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sir. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Aparnita, ma'am. Uh, yes, so, sir. yeah, after seeing the last video, actually, I was recalling about my Antarctica trip. Me and Felix were both in the 36th expedition. It was like recollecting our memory in the 2016-17. It was really wonderful. And so, uh, here from the question, uh, there are a lot of questions. So I also picked one question. Uh, it is like, uh, it is from the Manika Mishra. What are the major problems located in Arctic ecosystem due to the decline of sea ice? Yeah, uh, uh, there is one recent uh, thing that has been uh, come up in the Arctic is actually uh, the, the the change in the timings of the, the spring blooms is really an important uh, aspect. And uh, another thing is that uh, there is a lot of fresh water that is coming into the Arctic and uh, the communities is uh, community the, the community structure is changing so uh, and another thing that recently that we have uh, noticed is like uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 diurnal uh, migrations of uh, uh, the sorry not the diurnal migrations the uh, is there any primary productivity or uh, the phytoplankton activity during winter this winter is mostly dark and uh, normally we expect that uh, it is quite, it, if, even if it is not there, but it is quite, a, 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 is at a minimal. But uh, there is seems some, something, some substantial kind of uh, uh, the biological activity that happens during winter. And uh, there are a lot of theories that has come out and uh, particularly from the Norwegian, uh, Norwegian group. So 
so these are the quite uh, interesting things that uh, that has uh, that has recently has uh, become the focus of uh, the research in uh, in Arctic, particularly the community structure change and uh, the because of the freshwater introduction into the Arctic. And there was a study which uh, shows that uh, uh, there, there are more kind of uh, 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 the freshwater, uh, the kind of what you call the, the freshwater lenses and associated communities uh, in, the, in, in the Arctic. Uh, then there was this, uh, uh, what is called the, the, the timing of the timing of the blooms and then uh, the winter time productivity. All these are quite quite uh, uh, quite focus of uh, uh, today's research in Arctic. Anyway, I'm not a, quite an expert in uh, the ecosystem kind of uh, study, but these are the kind of things that we gather when we read the literature and when we interact with others. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you, Ninchia. So now I'll in, uh, request Dr. Punita uh, to yes, go to the next <clears throat> next one. Sir, the next question is by. Ms. Pooja Ahuja, and she is asking, how will primary productivity change with decreasing sea ice and snow cover? Uh, that's what, that, what uh, uh, so see, uh, this is actually a continuation of my answer before. Like It's like the sea ice is declining, which exposes more uh, ocean to the atmosphere, which means that it is getting more warmer. So uh, as the ice decreases, then uh, uh, there is more light is that is going into the sea, first okay. of all. So yes, it will uh, it will enhance the the availability of light and of course the photosynthesis will be correspondingly increased. Mm -hmm. And uh, as said, as I earlier said that there will be some kind of changes in the community structure in Arctic and uh, the timings of the spring bloom that is going to uh, all those uh, that, that you know the, that is uh, that that. Um, that the, the peak productivity time may, may be shifting actually okay. into that. And this this will have a, a tremendous influence in recruiting the the, the tertiary producers like the fishes or uh, okay. uh, or uh, the higher higher level organisms because uh, the fishing is one of the most important activity in those uh, areas. So uh, this kind of changes has a direct impact on the livelihood of the people in uh, living in the Arctic. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, over thank to Jitendra, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Punita, ma'am. I'll request Dr. Krishnakant uh, is here. So, yeah. Okay, you can pick question from the, uh, the pool. Yeah. Uh, it was a very uh, nice talk, Dr. Nancy. Uh, it was very, very uh, uh, informative. Uh, now, I would pick uh, uh, one question from the pool. This question is asked by Sukriti Sarama. She asks that, uh, is there any relation between Arctic and Antarctic ocean current? Yeah, one, uh, one relation that I have shown you in terms of the global conveyor belt, which uh, in the Arctic, sorry, in, uh, sorry, in, uh, yeah, correct. In the Arctic, the water sinks and it's uh, move as a deep western boundary current all the way up to the Antarctic. And then uh, uh, it flows along the Antarctic continent and turns north. And upwards somewhere in Indonesia. This is a this is a tremendous process. Actually. It is a huge process that uh, has uh, hundreds of years of time scales. Uh, so that is one uh, connection. And then uh, the, in the, this is something we call the interhemispheric linkages. Uh, it's quite vague at present uh, in terms of the uh, if you scan the scientific literature, this interhemispheric links in the particularly in terms of the surface currents. Uh, it's uh, it's quite uh, it's quite big, but there are uh, some studies which shows the uh, shows that uh, the processes that happens in the southern hemisphere uh, impact the northern hemisphere at, uh, at 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 a time lag. So, other than that, it's very difficult uh, for me to say that there is a kind of uh, direct linkages between uh, uh, the. Uh, Arctic and Antarctic Ocean, particularly on the shorter time scales, uh, for example, on a, a months to weeks or such kind of time scale. Of course, on the on the kind of uh, on a decadal or kind of uh, in, uh, centennial time scales, definitely there is a link because uh, uh, you see that these are the time scales that uh, uh, that uh, the the freezing or the the atmospheric ocean interaction changes substantially. 
north and north atlantic at meridian low turning circulation changes okay. so so there will be differences in uh, the uh, the surface uh, northward moving current and at the same time the deep uh, the deep western boundary the south south southward moving currents so yeah there's uh, it depends on what time scales you look at actually so yeah yeah thank you uh, for for your uh, answer sir Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ninshu and Dr. Krishnakant. Now I will request Dr. Milan. Dr. Milan, uh, you are there. Hello. Yes. yes. Uh, first of all, I just like to congratulate uh, congratulate Dr. Ninshu for his illuminating and wonderful lecture. And uh, it is, uh, I think, very uh, interesting. And for me, some of the slides is it's very interesting. Uh, and some of the questions I uh, just like to pick up from the audience is uh, uh, one of the students, Nirmita Saudhuri, uh, she asked these questions, how the salinity and the temperatures variations in winter and the summers are related to the Arctic waters. That means how, uh, you like to know how, what are the conditions of the salinity uh, and the temperatures variations in winters and the summers? In, uh, in winter, mm. mostly there is a densification of water, which means the salinity normally increases. Mm. Uh, so, and the dense water sinks. And uh, in uh, parts of the Greenland Sea, uh, in the Norwegian, uh, and part of the Norwegian seas, the, 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 the water will become more saline and it sinks. And in summer, um, it, uh, part of the sea ice will melt and then uh, some of the river discharges will be there. That makes it more or uh, less saline. So uh, that is the seasonal cycle. So, so or if you take uh, the interannual time scales, uh, those processes that uh, uh, controls interannual time scales also controls the temperature and uh, salinity. So if you consider uh, time periods within uh, 10 years or so, what we mostly get is actually the, uh, the interaction of interannual time scale processes and the seasonal time scale processes. So if you definitely, if you say it is winter, the salinity will be mostly. Uh, uh, higher than during the summer, particularly the surface salinity. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, another question is from uh, Parameter Day, and uh, he like to know. He like to know: uh, Are there any bio uh, indicators by which these temperature changes can be observed? Sorry, uh, is there any bio indicators? Is there bio any organisms, plant, or uh, whatever it may be? Um, bio indicator wh uh, which can be observed in this particular changing of temperatures from time to time. I do not know actually really uh, if there are, uh, but there are uh, there are the, the, the paleoclimatologists. They study this uh, temperature changes with uh, the kind of phytoplankton, sorry, the zooplankton, uh, the zooplankton, uh, uh, the zooplankton, which is like the coccolithophores, force, all those things, and then they die and it goes uh, down into the sea and uh, their uh, the shells of the uh, their uh, is uh, some uh, the calcium uh, the calcium or carbonates or whatever it's made of, the shell will have a will response to the atmospheric uh, temperature of that particular time. And then when there is incorporated in the sediment and those people, they collect it and then they subject to the chemical analysis and they come out with, okay, this is the temperature in, in the past. And uh, this is the temperature it's like, so So definitely this kind of uh, zooplankton's uh, uh, can uh, indeed uh, uh, tell you about the past uh, climates. It's uh, those kind of, and, uh, uh, present climate, if you want to see that uh, if some organisms are there, if you, uh, if, if you see that some organisms are indicators of the warmer climates or uh, the colder climates, maybe there are kind of some fishes are there which prefer the warmer climates will move into the areas where the temperature are getting warmer. So you can look for the species who prefer the warmer, the warmer climate or the warmer waters. And if it is present in somewhere, we can, uh, in the, uh, we can um, say that, okay, the temperature is getting warmer, but uh, uh, yeah, why do we normally do that? It's like if in the present time we can readily go and uh, see that the temperature is, uh, is warmer or uh, cooler by just uh, measuring it out. So, but it is quite important for the uh, different species. So it changes its uh, its its uh, its uh, it's called it's all uh, it changes its uh, what do you call uh, the locality of its living. If the water is warmer, it, if it prefers that it will uh, migrate to those warmer climates, or if it is, if they prefer it's colder, it will migrate to the place where it is uh, more cold. 
So, but other Thank than that, if you want to construct the temperature uh, of the past, then uh, probably the the small organisms, zooplankton, may be the key. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Dr. Milan. And now I'll uh, request Dr. Punita uh, yes, for the <clears throat> uh, yeah. So two of our participants, they have asked questions on similar lines, like uh, how does the temperature fluctuation, this affects the uh, species residing in that area or the flora and fauna of that re region. So basically there are two participants, one of them is Deepak Ram and the other one is Soma Ganguly. They have asked these questions. Could you please throw some light on it? So it is like, uh, uh, the question is, uh, how the temperature changes or the flow regimes affect the species? Yes, sir. Yeah, it is, as I said earlier, like it is like uh, uh, some, uh, some species, is, uh, some species may, if they prefer the, the warmer climes, they migrate into, the, uh, into those regions. Exactly, I do not know like uh, which, which species prefer uh, uh, the warmer uh, region, warmer regions than uh, the colder regions. Uh, so definitely there is going to be a, a changes in the community structure within the Arctic uh, because of the more warmer the, the temperature is. Uh, okay. in, in more warm temperature and uh, reduction in sea ice. Okay. So, Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Ponita. Thank you. Now I'll request Dr. Felix uh, to say a few words. Dr. Felix. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Nancho. My uh, nice. Uh, you know, you, we both were junior research fellows. That I remember it such a long time back. And uh, Nancho, I'm very happy. I'm very happy that you're doing fantastic job. First class research in NCPR now. And uh, yesterday we had Matt Dewey, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Dewey from uh, British Antarctic Survey of Kid, and yeah. he shared his Antarctic experience. And now today that you shared your Arctic experience, so that makes the circle complete opportunity for us to listen to your Arctic experience. So, uh, you know, to add on to the point, I just want to emphasize because many of the listeners would like to see that Arctic is in, under tremendous pressure. So what kind of lifestyle changes do you recommend to help the Arctic to heal itself? Uh, so, uh, Felix, uh, it's not clear. Uh, could you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was asking, what lifestyle changes do you recommend to help the Arctic to heal itself? Lifestyle uh, changes, okay. Uh, maybe a less energy intensive lifestyle, like, uh, uh, like you do, like, uh, you know, like you bicycle more. It's like, uh, uh, so we all may adopt such kind of practices uh, than using uh, uh, carbon intensive uh, lifestyle where not only carbon intensive any any lifestyle that uh, uses more energy may lead to kind of uh, more wastage of energy which is uh, accumulating uh, so that could be one uh, lifestyle changes that we all have to do instead of uh, drying the clothes in an, uh, in a cloth dryer where you can uh, dry it in the sun so that is another lifestyle change so yeah, so, yeah, perfect, yeah, perfect, yeah, yeah. Nancyo. I'm really happy that you, you know, you are with me. I mean, we are all same on uh, environmental conservation, you know, yeah. leading a low carbon so, footprint lifestyle. So yeah, yeah, that is amazing. So these and, are the kind of things like when, if you say, for example, like uh, uh, see, normally I don't know, you, you are studying, uh, you are teaching in a college, like, so you may be seeing the students. So. So our concept is also evolved on such kind of things like who is a, who is a, who, who is a smart individual mostly in your college probably uh, the boys that may come in the bike may be a smartest guy for the girls so <laughs> those who come in uh, those who bicycle may not be the uh, smartest guy so these kind of things if you change it then uh, for example then if you say that if the, the, the girls started liking the guys like who's come in bicycles then probably that will have a more, much more impact on the environment it's a nice example for uh, Dr. Felix, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, Nanshi, I want to add one more point because I was also <laughs> part of the Indian Antarctic mission. 
And uh, many people ask me the same question that I would like to contribute into India Scholar Program. So mm -hmm. what recommendation do you provide to the aspiring scientists? Because you represent one of the most prestigious and premier institute for the, you know, overseeing the Indian Polar Mission. So what advice do you uh, give? Because majority of our viewers who is watching right, right now live, uh, maybe some of you, uh, some of the viewers would like to go to Arctic or Antarctic. So, yeah. So uh, this is uh, for uh, for students or for uh, those who are uh, like you now for students you know like uh, to be a polar scientist is to have a, a sound uh, first of all you must have a very sound understanding on uh, whichever uh, topics you you are pursuing even if it is biology physics chemistry or biology so polar science is nothing but the application of all sciences into the into the polar processes there is nothing else like so if you study even if you study biology there is an application of that in the polar science even if you study chemistry there is an application even if you study mathematics there is an application so but the thing is that un unlike the laboratory environment uh, uh, this uh, the, the environment that we see our experiments that we mostly conduct in the outdoors mostly so these are much more challenging and uh, much more time consuming if you lose one opportunity probably we lost it at all we don't have, we, there is no chance for a retake or there is a renewing of the experiment so uh, so we, you, one has to have a very strong uh, uh, understanding of the subject uh, you need to prepare very well before you go to the field to collect your uh, samples to collect your experiments to make your experiments and uh, and uh, the another mode uh, so basically it's like uh, have a strong uh, footing in your own uh, subject the fundamentals are clear of clear fundamentals uh, then aware of uh, what is the latest happenings uh, within the topics accordingly plan your experiments to fill the gap these are all the kind of uh, requirements for a uh, for people uh, not only in the polar science for an, uh, any 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 scientific uh, discipline and uh, the, the second thing is the, uh, which i consider is more important particularly during these uh, times is uh, you should be at the pink of your health as well so you really have to take care of your health uh, to go to the polar regions and then uh, to conduct the research sometimes we may have to be alone or sometimes we may have to be so remote uh, cut off from the rest of the rest of the people uh, with uh, very uh, with your own ration so encountering very strange and very severe weather conditions so you have to withstand your body has to withstand all those kind of uh, uh, all those uh, kind of agonies so your body as well as your mind has to withstand this kind of agony so if you have a, a good knowledge of your uh, topic and then if you are uh, uh, if you feel that you can uh, you can uh, challenge those uh, uh, environment then uh, polar uh, science is really the place to be yeah what a perfect answer uh, nancio i totally agree with you and uh, and more than that yes uh, the, you emphasized on maintaining a physical fitness and uh, you know healthy lifestyle so yeah definitely my advice to the viewers is uh, if you smoke please stop smoking and if you drink alcohol quit alcohol completely and uh, you know exercise regularly so this is uh, my advice i agree with uh, dr uh, nancio in his point so back to uh, jitendra yes you may start yeah Okay, so I'll request Dr. Punita to put his last question because already it is 12 or 7. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, uh, actually, most of the questions they have been answered, but uh, there is one question by Binny Mary Marvin Are the hyperactive cyclones forming nowadays influenced by the polar vortex? What is your opinion, sir? Uh, I don't uh, think so. There is uh, the polar link to the cyclones, uh, but uh, there is. Uh, see, that we have seen that uh, the link with in in uh, the Uttarakhand floods, and that was because of interaction of the Bay Bengal cyclone and uh, the uh, the cold the cold that had intrusion. But uh, other than that, uh, I have not seen any literature that has that is linking the. Link. The, the cyclones that is right now happening in the tropical, for example, along, along the southwestern coast of India and uh, the, to the poles. 
So I will. I would like to answer one uh, question as uh, that you have uh, all, uh, previously asked. Like it was like the troposphere temperature is much more. The, the tropopause temperature is uh, lower than in the poles. Yeah, one reason could be that the the tropopause in the the polar regions is at a very low altitude. Yes, sir. For example, eight, eight to ten kilometer. That's eight to nine kilometer. That's what I uh -huh. see in uh, uh, the in the polar regions. Whereas in the in the tropics, it can be quite high, maybe 12, 13, or something like that, 13, 14. So uh, the, the, the lapse rate, uh, if you consider the lapse rate, then uh, probably the, tropi the tropical tropos pause will be at a much higher height and hence at lower temperature than at the poles. Yeah. So, yeah. so it could be one reason. Uh, yeah, I just uh, it came to my mind. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Those were the questions from my end. Over to okay. Jitendra, sir. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Dr. Punita. So, yeah, already it's 12 10. So, we are, uh, we are uh, towards the end of this particular session. So, I should uh, I take this privilege to thank all the panelists present here to smoothly conduct the session. And uh, now, I mean, now, I thank Dr. Nancy for very informative, very nice presentation and the long discussion. They, he cleared most of the doubt. Many participants uh, asked the question in the similar line. So we picked up the question, which is more relevant to this particular session and talk. And he very nicely clarified those doubts. And I really uh, thank Dr. Nancy to agree for this particular event. And he, in his very short notice, he agreed and he, he, could, he was with us from last one hour and he was giving, sharing his experience and uh, informed us much about the Arctic region and about the climate, how the Arctic region is influencing the global climate. So it was a very nice, informative talk. Thank you once again, Dr. Nancio. Uh, it is a really wonderful talk and we, we enjoyed your talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for thank you Thanks all the lot, participants. Uh, thank you thanks. for all the participants, those who are uh, watching us on uh, online through YouTube. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, Patnaik, and thanks a lot, uh, Felix and uh, others, uh, uh, for uh, conducting this uh, online uh, seminar. I understand that there are many more people who are going to give talk, and it's a wonderful effort. Let's uh, keep the activity going on in these uh, tough times, and uh, it keeps the people engaged, and it is uh, it can keep. It, it helps to share the information. That's what all we need, actually, in these uh, times. And uh, we welcome you all uh, to more and more polar expeditions from your department. It will be very interesting to be all of all of you are a part of our uh, team some sometime or other in the future. So thanks a lot for this wonderful opportunity uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Thanks a lot and have a nice uh -huh. day. Thank you. Actually, I forgot to share. I have worked with some of the salvage sample, actually. Yeah, uh, okay. Salvage ah, sample okay. and we have published in one Polar Science and one in another ah. journal. Ah, okay, very nice. Yeah. About, okay. yeah, but I never visit. I have never part of this Arctic. Uh, yeah, definitely. Journal. It should come one day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you will join. Yeah, it was very nice to meet and nice uh, to listen to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, listen to your talk. Thank you one second. Thanks a lot. Uh, and for all, uh, Felix, uh, please announce yes, for the yes, next yes. session. Yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Nancho. And uh, yes, I also recollect my experience. In, uh, you know, a few years back, I was in Oslo and many, many museums I went to. Yeah, it's it's amazing uh, experience. Uh, yes, Norway is an amazing place to be. And from the bottom of my heart, Nancho, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And it's my pleasure, uh, to come in here. Uh, it's my pleasure, Felix. It's uh, it's always been a nice uh, op uh, opportunity for me, like to drag with you all. Thanks Perfect. a lot. Yeah. So today at three thirty is our next session by Professor Anna Frike. Anna Frike is uh, from prestigious Leibniz Institute in Berlin, and she is now going to talk on benthic algae, cryptic communities with high potential. So it's going to be a great session at 3.30 p.m. I, I invite you all to come, the last session of the entire Blue Planet series. And uh, followed by the, her talk is going to be for one hour. And at 4.30 onwards, we will start our valediction function. So uh, keep tuned. I will share more about the certification uh, at the end session, the last session of the day. So I'll see you all at, exactly at 3.30. And uh, goodbye for now. Have a nice day. <laughs>